Jimmy Rogers toured extensively, becoming hugely successful. In all, he sold an estimated 20 million records. There was great appeal in songs that were devastatingly personal. You find this guy who's playing a character of a railroad man. In, in several years after that, he is singing songs about how he has TB. I've got the T, B, blue. There's a, a new poignancy in country music because the artists are now saying, it's, this is about me and this is who I am, not some character. Eventually, Jimmy could no longer fight his illness, and in 1933, he died. Despite his short-lived career, the legacy he left would be immense. What happens with, with Rogers and the Carters is that each in their own right defines a line of country music that continues on to this day. Jimmy Rogers' final recordings didn't make anywhere near the kind of money previous records had. It was the 30s, and the Depression had hit sales badly. Work was scarce, and money hard to come by. Music was a way of dealing with the hard times, but for most people, records became a luxury they simply couldn't afford. People basically switched their musical alliances from records to the radio. If you got a radio, that was all you had to pay. And the music you got from the radio uh, was just as free as it could be. Something we all gathered around, watched the radio. It was our connection to the rest of the world, really, and it was where we heard whatever music we heard, uh, because this was, uh, even the old phonograph records weren't that great. But if you had a radio, you could uh, turn the dial and hear everything that was going on. As I read the list. Radio relied on live music, and more and more performers gave up trying to make records and turned instead to radio appearances. To fill airtime, the radio station started transmitting live band dances, which soon became the most popular shows. All around the country, uh, there were shows started that called themselves barn dances. They were really rural variety shows. It was Saturday night picking part of music, you know what I mean? Something that, again, people could identify with, say, hey, we got a group down here at the country store that can pick that good, you know? But that is, because it was on the radio, it made it special. Howdy, friends. Welcome to the Grand Ole Opry, the capital of country music throughout the world. Let her go, boys! The most successful barn dance was WSM's Grand Ole Opry. Broadcast from Nashville, Tennessee, it was to become an American institution and to this day remains the longest running radio show. Well, back then, you powered your radio with the wet cell batteries, the same battery you had in your car. And uh, so we didn't listen to much radio uh, during the week. We saved that battery for Saturday night so we could listen to the Grand Ole Opry. The man that owned the little grocery store a quarter of a mile from us, he had a radio. It was a battery radio. And on Saturday nights, uh, people would I've gone to his house when there'd be 30 people in his living room listening to the Opry on the radio. Although it appeared to be a very simple, spontaneous show, the Grand Old Opry was in fact highly orchestrated, with performers being encouraged to adopt a particular look. It was the announcer George Hay who created the dress code for, for the country performers that they needed to look as though they came out of the country. He really was an authentic country-oriented guy. And he had a, a saying that uh, some of the groups sometimes would start playing kind of hot and all. He'd say, keep it down to earth, boys, keep it down to earth. First, friends, we're going to hear from Roy Acuff and his Smoky Mountain Boys. Smoke it up, Roy. <laughs> Roy Acuff was the opera's first big star, and he quickly became a household name. 
he had a wonderful mountain style of singing. And at the time, he thought it was almost too old fashioned, but the audience didn't. And so he became uh, the first really big solo singer on the Grand Ole Opry. From the great Atlantic Ocean to the wide Pacific shore, from the queen of flowing mountains to the south bell by the shore, she's mighty tall and handsome and known well by all. She's the combination on the Wabash Cannonball. Acuff was the first one to come in and, and sing anything resembling a, a modern sentimental gospel country song on the Grand Old Opry. Life in the valley, the sun. Oh, life in the valley, Roy Acuff played up the mountain heritage in his music, and his appearances on the Opry radio shows allowed him to promote the values of traditional country music to a national audience. Get ready, children, he's coming after you. Roy Acuff was kind of the, 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 sort of like the founding father, or the, he was the, maybe the president at the time. Radio did more than spread the music to a wider public. It affected the nature of the music itself. The new sensitive microphones changed singing styles, leading to quieter, more intricate harmonies, which became the hallmark of many brother acts to emerge in the 1930s. There's a buzz that happens when family members that are related sing together. That's just haunting. The Stanley Brothers epitomized the brother harmony style, creating a unique sound which seemed to give new depth to songs. I like the harmony. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, like words. I like words too, but I think the harmony makes the song. For me, when it comes to just that kind of harmony singing, it's the Stanley Brothers all the way. I mean, the harmonies that they were were eerie, unearthly. Carter Stanley died in 1966, leaving Ralph to carve out his own solo career. I've carried that singing on, you see, for 30-some years. And I never did come out front too much in, other than singing until he passed away, and then I had to. The Leuven brothers, with their perfectly pitched voices, took harmony to new heights. The Lubin brothers were really cutting edge. They're, they had followed in, the, in a long line of brother duets. Their songs were simple country songs, and yet their melodies and the way they did their harmonies were just so unique. We just sang together uh, from children on up. He knew when the melody was going to go too high for me, and I knew it. So we didn't have to wink at each other or step on each other's toes. We got to where we could change in the middle of a word. There's a thing that happens with duet harmonies that you don't get in three-part. They're jumping, they're going all the way from unison to octave and everything in between. And you have to do that when you play duet music. You have to use every trick you can think of to make it interesting.
they uh, did something that country music is very good at, and that is to take something that's old and making it new again. In fact, their most popular song, Knoxville Girl, was an Americanized version of a murder ballad from the British Isles. I don't know what it is about the Knoxville Girl that the public likes, because it, it is an extremely uh, morbid song. Originally called the Wexford Girl, it describes the violent killing of a young girl by her lover. I met a little girl in Knoxville, a town we all know well. And every Sunday evening out in... It's one of a number of ballads that involved the murder of young girls. There's an entire subgenre of these. I picked a stick up off the ground and knocked that fire girl down. It sounds happy and it sounds plain, but actually, it's very dark and very heavy. Oh, Willie, dear, don't kill me here. I'm unprepared to die. All at once, he just grabbed up a stick and beat her to death. <laughs> Don't say why he did it. Until the ground around me within her blood did flow. In the original version of the song, the murderer escapes the law, but in America, justice prevails. Our puritanical upbringing said if you're going to enjoy a song, then you better learn something from it a moral lesson. Now, for doing that deadly deed, here's what happened to him. They carried me down to Knoxville and put me in a cell. And my friends all tried to get me out, but none could go my bail. So I'm here to waste my life away down in this dirty old jail because I murdered that Knoxville girl, the girl I love so well. That, that's about all the story. Despite their huge success, the Louvins fell out over Ira's drinking and eventually split up. Brothers do have a history of breaking up for one reason or another. I just didn't know how to handle a, a drinker, so that's what finally broke the uh, team up. Half of the duet can't carry the show. I don't care how hard you work. You can't do both of the parts. Another brother duo unable to reconcile their differences were the Monroes. They only sang together for a few years, splitting in 1938. But the breakup meant that the younger brother, Bill Monroe, would go it alone and become legendary as the father of bluegrass. It's, uh hard to imagine what American music would sound like today without the influence of Bill Monroe. 